Okay, hello, my name is Meg Riley and I work at the Plymouth County Center for Agriculture. I am the Agricultural Extension Educator for Plymouth County. And today we're gonna to talk about the basics of navigating backyard chickens. Uh, just to start, a little bit about myself. So I've worked in agriculture for 20 years. Um, I went off to UMass Amherst. I have a degree in environmental science and biology, which much to my parents' shock, they were questioning if environmental science was even a job. Um, nowadays, that seems laughable because the more we learn about our environmental impacts, we all know the importance of understanding what we can be doing to better take care of our planet. Um, when I was at UMass taking environmental science classes, one thing that kept on coming up repeatedly was the impacts of agriculture on our environment. So one thing that led me into this job field um, is definitely a desire to learn how to um, work through farming in a way that we can grow food that's delicious and healthy for people, but then also is not detrimental to our planet. Um, so over the 20 years, I've had the good fortune of working um, for a number of different organizations, raising animals, meeting lots of people, um, and I can truly say that I feel very lucky to have such a job, to have such a wonderful job that I love so much. So today we're going to talk a little bit about chickens because chickens have become really popular lately. So in the past three years since the pandemic, a lot of people have felt maybe a little bit nervous about where their food is coming from. And so a lot of people have gotten really excited about putting chickens into their backyard. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about some things to consider before you get chickens, um, because it can definitely be a commitment. So first of all, some benefits to having chickens in your yard. Um, number one, you can raise your own meat. You can choose exactly what kind of grain goes into your, your, your chickens. Um, you can raise your own eggs. You can stop depending on chemical-based nitrogen fertilizers because your chickens will be producing quite a bit of that on their own. Um, some people also choose to have chickens just as a backyard pet. They can make great companions. Um, and again, back to having meat and eggs that you produce on your own for your family, it's a great way to reduce your environmental impact by reducing your food miles. Now, just like anything else, there's always pros and cons. So some considerations before you jump right in and head to the feed store and get some baby chicks is that number one, your birds will need daily care. If you're keeping chickens for eggs, they will be laying eggs for approximately three years before they stop laying. At that time, you have to decide if you want to continue to feed them and keep them as pets. And if you do keep them, their natural lifespan can be anywhere up to 10 years. Um, you also wanna take into consideration feed costs. So right now, just like everything else with inflation, the cost of chicken feed has risen dramatically. Um, also, some other things to take into consideration is that having chickens in your backyard, just like we think they're delicious, so do a lot of other predators, um, and they can sometimes be considered a coyote supermarket right there in your backyard. Uh, also, uh, if you are keeping chickens for a pet, just like every other pet, they're going to need um, vet care. So it can be a little tricky to sometimes find a veterinarian that will see chickens. So these are just some things to keep in mind before you make the purchase. So before you head out with a box of baby chicks, there's a couple of things. First of all, you really need to do your research on your local chicken bylaws. So here in Westboro, um, the town recently overhauled the chicken bylaws. And a lot of these things make sense. So there is a directive about how close you can have your coop to your neighbors. There's some directives about space issues. Um, but some towns, or for example, condo associations, may have regulations where you're not allowed to keep chickens at all. Other towns also have regulations where you cannot keep a rooster. Now, most chickens are sexed before they are uh, purchased, but not all types of breeds can be sexed, number one. And even sexed chickens, it's about a 98% chance um, that it's a hen, but there can always be that 2% chance that you end up with a rooster. So before we have to see your sad post on Facebook that says you have to rehome your chickens, it's a good idea to check first with your community and your town laws. 
So next up, you want to select the breed that is best for the job at hand. So here on the screen, we have three very different types of chickens. The first one looks kind of like a snowball, a golden snowball poof is a silky. So a silky is a, uh, a bantam variation. A bantam meaning that it is a smaller breed of chicken. A bantam can be an awesome idea if you have a small backyard. I live in a pretty suburban area. Um, my own backyard is less than half an acre, so I raise uh, bantam chickens. As a matter of fact, I brought here today, um, I brought my bantam rooster. So his name is Scruffy, and Scruffy's gonna have a lot to say about it. But Scruffy is a one-year-old bantam rooster. So I'm holding him in my hand, and he probably weighs maybe at most about five pounds. So I have six bantam chickens, and they don't take up a very large area in my yard. Um, so they're pretty easy to care for. And uh, one of the cool things is, is that bantam hens, just like every other breed of hen, they lay delicious eggs. So depending on what you would like to have, um, a bantam lays a very small type of egg, very small con um, in comparison to the eggs we get at the grocery store. In the center picture, you'll see a flock of standard bred chickens. So we have a couple different breeds. Looks like we have some Rhode Island Reds um, in the mix here. And these lay the eggs that we're very used to seeing at the supermarket. So we've all been raised on the brown eggs or local eggs, and local eggs are fresh song, which really is just a marketing ploy because just because you have a Rhode Island Red that lays brown eggs does not mean that Rhode Island Reds come from Rhode Island. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm now holding in my hand, I'm, I'm holding a blue egg. So it's actually really cool because depending on the type of chicken that you get, you can actually have a large variation in the color of eggs, including pink, um, a dark green color, blue, tan, white. So it's really dependent on what you want your egg selection to look like. Um, the third chick in this picture is the most common uh, meat chicken in America right now. This is a Cornish cross. So a meat chicken obviously has a whole different purpose and their body really reflects that. So um, meat chickens are typically ready to be consumed at the age of 12 weeks. So Cornish cross hens, I have raised these before. Um, one of the things I don't love about this breed is that they're so focused on eating food that they really are not very active, and so sometimes they're very, very lazy birds. So at this time, I'm raising a type of meat bird in my backyard um, <laughs> called a Freedom Ranger. And so she's a pretty, pretty good-sized girl. Um, she is at least twice the size of my bantam bird. So this is a meat chicken. And this chicken right here today is 12 weeks old. So if I had to hold her for too long, my arms would get really tired because she has some really good weight on her. So again, if you look at her body structure, it looks totally different because unlike an egg bird where all of their energy is going to the production of eggs, all of her energy is going to the production of building, um, building mass on her body for us to consume. So I'm gonna put her back. Her name is Honey. And if you do decide to raise meat birds in your yard, just know that meat birds eat a lot of food and therefore they go to the bathroom a lot too. So that's one of the differences between the types of birds. So most people who decide to get chickens in their yard typically will select um, egg laying birds and they'll select them to obviously offset their cost of their eggs in their yard. Now, I would caution because right now, yes, in, with inflation, our, the cost of eggs has risen dramatically, but if you're getting chickens to save money, I would say that there's such a deep investment, and we'll talk about that in a minute when we talk about all the things you need to get to raise healthy birds, so you definitely would not be saving money for at least the first few years. But eggs themselves, can, like we showed before, they can come in different shapes, sizes, and colors, but eggs are oftentimes called nature's perfect food because 
They're high in protein. They average between six and nine grams of protein. Um, as far as calories, typically it's you know approximately 80 calories per egg, depending on the size. They're high in vitamin D, E, vitamin B6. Um, they're a good source of calcium and zinc. Now, the other thing too is you'll notice again that there's a really wide variation in color. The shell color has absolutely no uh, indication about the health of the egg. The health of the egg um, is based on what that chicken has eaten and how fresh it is. So it doesn't matter what color you eat, they're all still really good for you. So if you've decided that you're going to get chickens, you've checked them with your town, you know exactly which breed you want and why, you're getting ready to welcome home your chickens. So when you get chickens, typically if you are getting them shipped to your door or picking them up at a feed store, they're going to be um, about a day old. So when you get those birds home, they're not going to have a mother hen to keep them warm. So you basically have to copy that hen and do everything for the bird that they need. Now on the left hand side, you'll see a silver lamp. So this right here is a typical heat source for young chickens. Now, I no longer use this as a heat source because heating lamps are like one of the number one causes of barn fires um, in America. So a lot of farmers are now changing over and using what's called a heat plate. So that's over here on the right. And a heat plate um, does a better job of mimicking the heat that would come off of a hen and um, you're also less likely to burn your chicken as well. So these are a bit of an investment. This larger one's about $50 versus a heat lamp, which is typically around $15. Um, but if you are planning on you know, raising um, more than one batch of chickens, it's a good investment. The other thing too is that um, I often try to work with other farmers to borrow heat plates. So I try to line up when I'm gonna have chicks so that's not the same time as all my friends. The box that you see in the middle, this is what we call a brooder. So when your chickens are very young, they're gonna need a place that is like safe and dry and they are never too far away from their food, their water, or their heat. Um, it's also a great idea to make sure that it's screened in because chickens get the ability to fly pretty early on. Um, and if you don't cover up your brooder, you will be chasing your chickens all over the barn or all over your garage or wherever you're keeping them. So once you have all the basics that you need, you're going to want to think about a coop. I can't tell you how many people call me up and they have bought the birds, they have them tucked in at home, and they don't have a coop yet. So I would, I would instruct people to plan for the coop before you actually go out to get your birds. So a couple things. Um, down in the lower corner right here, this is a pretty standard size uh, chicken setup that you can get like at a tractor supply or a local feed store. A lot of these are made of particle board. They're very, very lightweight. And that might be a great coop for you to start with, but it's not gonna be a long-term solution. So um, these coops can typically range around $200 to $300. Um, but again, they're not gonna hold up to New England winters for very long. You'll also notice that the run area that's off to the side, that's the side that's kind of fenced in. It's really small. And so if your chickens don't have enough room in their run, the first thing that they usually do is pick on each other, pull their feathers out, and it can really make for an unfun situation. Up above, this is a converted shed that somebody turned into a chicken coop. So I often tell people that if you're in chickens for the long haul, that you're gonna wanna, you know, same kind of building materials, you would build a shed to protect like your lawnmower. Um, it's the same kind of investment into your chickens. So I have a chicken coop that is really sturdy, it's really well built, and it's probably gonna last me, I would say, probably at least 20 years if I choose to raise chickens in my yard for that long. So chicken coops don't have to be expensive. Um, it's really important that they keep birds safe from predators. Um, you need to have some ventilation at all times. You don't want your chicken coop to be so closed up that there's never airflow. Um, chicken urine and chicken feces can have a lot of ammonia in it, and so it can build up and make your chickens unwell if they don't have enough oxygen. Um, you also need some sort of access to the outside. Uh, in some parts of the country, yes, large-scale chicken farms, the birds never go outside. Um, but I would say unless you have a very large barn and you've accounted for that, most birds will need an outdoor space. Um, now this coop right here, we're going to talk a little bit about meat birds. So I raise some meat birds in my backyard, which is again pretty small, less than half an acre. 
Um, and I have what's called a mobile hoop. So this is actually pretty heavy duty. It's made out of plywood. Um, and it has uh, hardware cloth all the way underneath it so no animals can sneak up underneath. But this is where my meat birds live for the 12 to 14 weeks that I have them in my yard. Now, if you look up in this little corner right here, you can't really tell what that is in the grass, but that is what is left behind. I move my chicken coop every single day, and there's definitely evidence that my birds have been here. I do not recommend this type of coop if you have a yard where your kids will be running around or your dogs will be running around because your dog will be attracted to eating this stuff and it's not really great for them. Um, this is the feces that's left behind from my meat birds every single day. And what I'm doing is I'm using this as a straight from the bird to my grass nitrogen source. Now it can be very high in nitrogen and actually burn. Um, it can burn plants. I don't recommend using straight nitrogen on your garden plants. But for the backyard, um, what I do is I kind of rake out any clumps and let that nitrogen kind of settle in. And my grass in the areas that I've had my meat birds is remarkably greener than the places I don't. Now with meat birds, again, you're producing protein for your family. So you can decide, do you want to feed your chickens organic food, uh, grain, excuse me, conventional grain, or you can also select non-GMO. Now, having meat birds is really a short-term commitment. So typically, like I was saying before, about 12 weeks is the standard time. Um, so it's a quick turnaround. So a lot of people will raise meat birds in the warmer months, fill up their freezer, and then not do it again in the cooler months. Um, this is a great way for you to, number one, know where your food is coming from, and number two, like we talked about before, reducing your food mileage. If you're trying to think about what is your carbon footprint, and how much fossil fuels are created to, to get your food to you to consume, this is one way um, to reduce that. I like to raise meat birds because honestly too, the other thing is I did not, not include is that they're very tasty and delicious. Um, now, unfortunately, one thing that is happening at this time in our country is that we have an avian bird flu outbreak. Um, this is definitely impacting us in a lot of different ways, which we'll talk about next, but at this point in time, um, over 58 million birds have been killed because of the bird flu, right? So that's not just chickens. It could be egg-laying chickens. It could be meat chickens. It could be turkeys. Um, and this, the avian bird flu is actually very contagious. And unfortunately, now you'll notice in the first section, wild birds. So over 6,500 wild birds have also died from the bird flu. Um, we had a bird flu outbreak in 2015. This one is much more serious uh, because unfortunately it has become endemic, meaning that now it has really established itself in wild bird populations. So for example, in my backyard coop, I currently, you'll notice too, my, my meat birds, they're all underneath the tarp. And that's because I don't want the feces of wild birds dropping in my yard and making my own birds sick. Um, it has also jumped from birds to uh, bird flu has been found in bears, it's been found in coyotes. So again, um, it's really starting to kind of impact our food supply and then also some of our wild species as well. So again, because the bird flu has, um, is, has become common across America, this has had the direct effect of increasing the cost of our eggs and the cost of our meat. Obviously, if we've taken 58 million birds out of our food supply, then that means that the birds that we do have left are gonna be more expensive for us to raise. Um, so, a couple things. A lot of people are excited to start with chickens, but they don't take into consideration that chickens are an every single day commitment. Now, every single day, you're gonna to need to feed your chickens, they're gonna need fresh water, you have to collect their eggs, um, daily cleanup could involve just like some light scooping of uh, different poop from the coop. Um, a full coop clean out is not a daily event. Some farmers will go as, as much as many months before they clean up. Oftentimes what they'll do is they will add more and more pine shavings or other bedding. It's called the deep bedding method. And what that does is during the winter months, this is a smart idea because it's insulating your coop and the, um, the poop underneath is starting to compost, so it will create heat. So this is one of the ways you can help to keep your coop warm in the wintertime. But it's important that you're adding clean bedding to the top because the birds will, will rely on that clean bedding so that they're not constantly interacting with their own feces or if they're wet and cold. So like I said, it is an everyday occurrence that you're gonna to need to take care of your birds, but there are some time-saving measures that have been put in place. 
So the first picture on the left, you'll notice the solar panel. So what you can do is you can get a solar powered chicken door put on your coop. These can range anywhere in cost from 400 all the way up to, you know, in excess of, you know, $800, depending on how complex the system is. Some of them are not solar powered, some of them are battery powered with a timer. Um, some of them have clickers and things like that so that you can remotely um, shut your door. But basically, chickens uh, have a very scheduled kind of um, lifestyle. So oftentimes, chickens, when it's, when it's bright outside, they want to be outside. When it gets dark outside, they will naturally go inside. So you can set your coop door so you don't have to walk outside your house or night to shut the door. You can use your remote control once it gets dark. I would caution, though, that um, you're going to want to keep your eyes the first couple weeks of using this because some chickens might not be used to this, and so you might have a couple of stragglers outside who aren't quite in the habit yet. Um, in the middle picture, you're going to notice it looks like a big metal kind of trash can almost with like a flap on it. So again, if every single day you're putting out food for your chickens and you want to shave some time off of that, there are large scale feeders where you can add even up to like a 50 pound bag of food and it will slowly release the food depending on how much your birds are eating. Um, I choose not to do that because one of the things that can happen with that is when you have too much food being left out or kicked around, it can also attract a lot of pests to your coop. The last picture here is of a big blue drum. So this is a giant water system. Um, a lot of times to keep your water clean, you can train your chickens to use a nipple style system. And you'll notice it's covered on top and it's covered because pretty much anywhere there's a flat surface, it's gonna attract your birds to sit on it and then go to the bathroom on it. So please make sure if you do, do use a large scale food trough or a large scale water trough that you keep it all covered because otherwise you'll find out the hard way what chickens love to do. Um, now one thing is, is that a lot of people will contact me and they'll say, oh, I want to get chickens in my yard because I'm going to use them as my like natural garbage disposal. And in reality, especially if you are trying to raise a meat chicken for your food or you're trying to raise an egg laying bird for eggs you're going to consume, you want to have your animals have a healthy, well-balanced diet. So a few things. So first of all, all birds should always have access to a well-balanced poultry feed. Again, you can select organic, non-GMO, conventional, but again, a healthy diet has vitamins and nutrients that are selected for that specific type of chicken. One thing you may not realize, if you have a rooster, you should not be feeding um, egg-laying pellets because it's too much calcium for the rooster and for the long term, it can do kidney damage. So the best idea if you have a mixed flock with roosters and hen is to feed them, hens, excuse me, is to feed them chick food and then add in on the side, you can do oyster shells. Um, and that will kind of like meet their needs without putting too much calcium in for the roosters. Now, again, a lot of people will feed their leftover food scraps and I definitely do this. Um, there are some scraps that you can feed safely and that are healthy for the birds and that are some that are not safe and that are not recommended. Um, so first of all, scraps should only make up about 10% of your chicken's diet. So it kind of goes back to what we talked about before, that healthy diet is the basis of the chicken grain. Now, safe things, a lot of like vegetables, vegetable scraps, cucumbers, microgreens, lettuce, um, things that are usually healthy for us are usually healthy for chickens. Now there are a couple things that go against that. So rhubarb and nightshade vegetables like tomatoes, eggplant, they actually have um, a chemical in them that can make chickens very sick. So we don't want to give them that even though those are healthy foods for people. Now in addition to that, you also don't want to feed your chickens like McDonald's or pizza. I, I never give my chickens dairy overall. But usually the guide is if it's not the best choice for me, it's not the best choice for my chickens. You can feed them like wheat bread. I usually give my chickens the ends of, of my bread loaf. Um, and oftentimes too, like having snacks can really be like a boredom buster for chickens. They, my chickens love in the morning. I always put the food out in the run, the special treats before they get out there. So they love in the morning to run outside and see which special treat I've given them. But again, this is always balanced out with my chickens have a full feeder of grain. Um, now, 
again, food goes in and then waste comes out, right? So a couple things. Um, a lot of people will have chickens because they are such an awesome source of uh, a natural nitrogen fertilizer. So there are a few things to consider. Depending on the size of your yard, you will have quite a bit of manure and waste produced by your birds. So everyone should have a plan of where that waste is going to end up. Um, now raw manure that you pull right out of your coop, you do not want to put that onto your garden beds. It will burn your plants, it's so high in nitrogen. Um, you also don't want to put it on, onto vegetables, right? So raw manure can contain salmonella and E. coli, which is another reason why anytime you handle your chickens or your birds or their waste products, you should always wash your hands afterwards. Um, now what I do with my waste is I collect it and then I compost it. So I have a pile that I share with my neighbor. We put grass clippings, we put leaves, and then we put all the stuff in the chicken coop. So typically to keep smells down, I will put that nitrogen rich um, chicken waste and then I will bury it with leaves to also kind of balance out the carbon and to reduce the smell. Um, USDA regulations are such that you are unable to grow vegetables and have them be in the USDA organic program if you are using manure that's, that's, that's less than six months of age, right? So you want to wait at least six months from when you have put it you know, in the compost pile to when you are putting it onto your vegetable garden. Um, now compared to other kinds of manure, chicken manure is high in nitrogen, high in potassium, phosphorus, calcium, um, and it's very rich in organic matter. So typically your chicken, when you clean out your chicken coop, you're also cleaning out the bedding. So whether that's straw or I use wood pine shavings, those are all going in the compost too. So it has a nice balance of different nutrients that are feeding in. Um, additionally, organic matter that's added to your soil increases its ability to hold water um, it also reduces erosion. So again, you know, having chickens to have eggs, you're going to naturally have this benefit of getting a really awesome free source of fertilizer. Some people will even choose to sell their chicken manure. Um, it might be like in your neighborhood. There are some companies that will even, for larger scale of farms, will come to your, to your property and collect it to add to their own compost. Now, another thing to, to keep in mind, a lot of people, um, they have heard the benefits of having chickens to reduce ticks in their yard. So there has been some studies behind this, and it has been shown that typically um, meat chickens are more likely to eat ticks than egg-laying chickens. Again, if your chickens have a well-balanced diet, not that they won't eat ticks, but it just won't be their first choice of what to select. Um, so the chicken in the corner here, uh, I believe it actually has a frog in its mouth. I have seen chickens eat a lot of different things. Like I've seen a chicken eat a baby bird before, I've seen a chicken eat a mouse before. So chickens are truly omnivores and they will eat a lot of different things that they're able to get their beak on. Um, but again, if you're getting chickens just to have less ticks in your yard, I would say that that's not the best investment. The other thing is that if your chicken coop is staying in one spot and your chickens only have access to that one spot, they're not gonna be able to reduce pest populations in other areas of your yard. They're only gonna be able to reduce pests where they actually are. Now on the flip side, having chickens can also bring new pests to your home. So a few things, you'll notice in the corner that there's a picture of some tin cans with very tightly fitting lids. So you should never be leaving any sort of chicken grain like in a bag or in even like a, um, like a bin container because rats and mice can eat through one of those pretty quickly. So I recommend that you, uh, you put any edible grains inside of a tight fitting container to, to distract or to, to, uh, to keep animals out of it. In addition to mice, again, you could also invite rats to your home. Um, there are, of course, even the problem of attracting predators to your home. So depending on what part of Massachusetts, you could also have a problem with bears, for example. And bears are pretty amazingly strong animals, and they will oftentimes rip parts of a chicken coop down, especially some of those lower quality chicken coops, um, to eat the chickens and also access the grain. So these are just concerns that you should think about when you are investing in your chicken coop because it's not just the fun stuff that we should think about. 
Um, another thing to bring up is that if you are making the commitment to have birds at your home for the long term, especially with egg laying birds, there are a few things that are common issues that we see over and over again. So the first chicken on the left, um, she is a barred rock, which is a fantastic egg laying bird. And you're gonna notice that she's sitting in a bath. She's basically taking a chicken bath. Now, this is an example of a chicken that's egg bound. So sometimes what can happen is a chicken produces an egg and it basically gets stuck and it does not fully get laid. Um, now, this can actually be a really serious situation because if that egg is to break inside of the chicken's body, it can cause infection um, and it can also cause death. So if you notice that you have a chicken that's having trouble walking, it's not eating that much, it looks a little lethargic, um, one solution can be that if you soak your bird in some nice warm water to kind of like relax them, relax their muscles, sometimes you can get them to pass that egg bound egg. Uh, the next picture, if you take a close look, um, chicken waste can come in like a lot of different shapes and sizes, if, depending on what your bird has eaten. If, it, if it's eating a lot of wet foods, it can be more towards the wet side. If it's eating a lot of dry foods specifically, it'll be a little bit more dry and stuck together, more formed. But this right here, we can clearly see that there's blood in the stool of the bird. Um, this is the hallmark of coccidiosis. So coccidiosis is a very common uh, parasite that can basically impact your bird's health and ability. And what it does is it, um, it kind of destroys the stomach lining of your bird. So oftentimes, if you see a bird, again, who's lethargic, chickens as a prey animal, they will try to use up all their energy to make it look like they are healthy. So oftentimes I hear from people when they say, I saw this bird this morning, it looked fantastic, and by nighttime the chicken was dead. Like what could it possibly have been? So again, chickens are gonna try to mask any illness as much as possible. So you could go out and look at your birds, and everyone looks pretty healthy, but if you see signs of diarrhea with blood in it, take a closer look and try to figure out which bird that's coming from because they're probably masking coccidiosis, which can also then be transferred to all the other birds in your flock. Um, coccidiosis is pretty easy to treat. You usually go out and you get a medicine that you add to their water container, so you're treating everybody in the flock. Um, and if it's caught early enough, it's usually pretty easy to clear up. Another common issue that pretty much every person who has chickens will run into sooner or later are chicken mites. Now, this one is a really gross one because sometimes you'll be able to see the mites crawling on your birds, um, but a lot of people, the first way that they find out that they have mites is if they're spending time with their birds and all of a sudden you feel something creepy crawling on you, that's, a lot of, that's oftentimes a sign that your chickens have mites. Now, before you go out and burn the whole coop to the ground, just know that chicken mites cannot impact us. We are not a suitable um, host for them, so if you do get chicken mites on you, just take a shower and you'll wash them all off. If you do notice mites on your birds, the first thing you should do is you should fully clean out your chicken coop down to the wood and you should put a lot of diatomaceous earth down Diatomaceous earth kills mites in a kind of a couple of ways. Number one, it's very, very fine dust, and so it will kind of smother them. Now the other thing too is, even though it seems very fine, if you look under a microscope, it has all sharp edges, and so when the mites are getting diatomaceous earth on them, they actually get cut up, and it can destroy them. So diatomaceous earth is non-toxic. You should always wear a mask when you're cleaning out the coop or using like a fine dust like diatomaceous earth. Um, so then you would, you would put that all over your coop, put down new clean fresh bedding, and then before you put your birds back, you can actually give them a bath. It seems kind of crazy, but chickens actually love to get bathed. Um, I use typically um, baby shampoo and warm water, and then I fully dry off my bird, and then I would give it a blow dry, like a quick blow dry, because otherwise their downy feathers underneath can get really wet and soggy, and that's not very comfortable for the bird. So I would clean off my bird, and then I would monitor them to see if I was able to eradicate the mites. So a couple things is that if you are considering um, getting chickens, I highly recommend it. Again, I've raised numerous birds over my 20 years in agriculture. Um, but I would also say the most important thing is to try to get the best quality information that you possibly can. 
I'm on Facebook. I'm a member of many different um, homesteading, small farming groups. And it's absolutely insane with how much misinformation that I see on Facebook on a regular basis. So I typically tell people, um, if you look up extension, the first couple of websites on here, they're all through um, different extension offices. So extension, again, is um, here in Massachusetts, it is the science of agriculture that's funded you know, through the state, through our universities, it's all science-based material. Um, there is actually a, a site called mypetchicken.com, which has really, it's kind of a fun site. You can get as few as four chickens sent straight to your homes so if you want to get different kinds of breeds, like some fun breeds. Um, they're a great resource for that. They also have a, a blog and some different kind of like discussion groups. Um, but I do find most of the information on there to be scientifically correct. Um, another thing to do also, as far as a resource, is reach out to friends of yours who might already have chickens. A lot of people have kind of learned all these lessons the hard way, and if you ask them, they'll want to help you so that you don't have to make the same mistakes that they did. Um, another thing too I would also recommend is if you can find another friend to raise your chickens with you, that's always good. You can share the eggs, you can share the responsibilities when you have to go on vacation and things like that. So. I hope that this presentation today kind of helped answer some of your questions and maybe alleviate some fears that you might have if you're thinking about getting backyard chickens. Um, again, I would definitely recommend it. It can be a really excellent thing to do. So I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much.